Hi guys. So if you are looking at this video, it is because you looked at my first video introducing Poe and the Tales of Heart, as well as read the short story. So um, I'm going to show you guys how I would analyze a short story of this caliber. And it's pretty straightforward. Um, you might think it's a bit far-fetched, but that's me being an English teacher, so deal with it. So the Telltale Heart. So this is how I would analyze the short story by looking at the analysis questions, as well as the four symbols I asked you guys to look out for, which I'm going to kind of recap in the next couple of slides. At the end of this second video, you just need to do one thing, and that's answer the following question in the comment section of this week's class, which is, in your opinion, who or what is the narrator truly trying to destroy and why? So um, quick summary of the story. So the narrator states he is not crazy. He is bothered by this old man's heart. He kills this man by suffocating him. He hides the man's body under the floorboards, is greeted by policemen. Then he hears a loud, rapid heartbeat. Then he freaks out and states that it's the old man's body, which is his hideous heart, that is actually under the floorboards, right? So analysis questions. So what does the story's title mean? So it says the tale, tale, heart. So we understand that we have a little mini alliteration and we have the idea that it's the heart. But if you rearrange the order, it's that the heart tells a tale and it's the tale of this narrator because the heart is a very truthful telling symbol. Now the narrator claims he is not mad and what evidence do we have that he is? Well, the fact that he was stalking the old man and like literally eavesdropping and opening the door with his flashlight and being like, hey, like that's kind of weird. Um, the fact that he decided to hide the body in his own house like you could have thought of other places to do it, but no, you decide to do it in the comfort of your own home. Okay, fine. Now it says here the two controlling symbols in the story are the eye and the heart because he kills the man first for his eye and then he freaks out about his heart. What might these two symbols represent? Well, we're going to look at the next slides for that. What does the act of hiding the body under the floorboards of a house symbolize? So the idea of hiding something within your own home, it really shows how much of an egotistical narrator we're dealing with here. Like someone that's proud of his work, to kind of put it into like a trophy kind of state of mind, he literally puts it within the comfort of his own home. If you had any sense of regret, you would have probably hit it far away from where you live. But this guy's like, I'm good. Now, as a narrator stricken with guilt, and what is the difference between guilt and remorse? Now, guilt, as we know, is when you feel at fault for doing something wrong. And the sense of feeling remorse is that there's a sense of regret. Now, do we think that this narrator does feel guilty? And now you're gonna tell me like, well, yeah, but if you're guilty, you do feel regret. No, you could totally um, be rushing on the 20 at 120 kilometers an hour um, because you're needing to rush to get there somewhere on time. Um, and you cause no accidents, but yet you still got a ticket for whatever amount that you got a ticket for. Um, do you feel guilty if you got somewhere on time? Not necessarily. Um, are you pissed you got caught? Uh, yeah. Now, the idea of feeling remorseful is that you felt a sense of regret. This narrator, did he feel regret? Not really. I think he's just pissed that he got technically caught because he opened his mouth at the end, right? Okay. So let's look at the next four symbols. So I told you guys to look out for the eye, the vulture, the wooden planks, and then the heart. So we're gonna break it into these four different categories. Now, when you think of, and we'll start with the eye, you have to imagine that the eye has a big um, symbolism here. Now, a lot of people think the eyes are the windows to the soul or something like that. No. Um, the eye is actually very interesting because he refers it often to the evil eye, even capitalizing the two E's, right? Therefore personifying it. Now, the evil eye is something that's actually heard in Judeo-Christian traditions. Um, and anyone out there that's Greek will know that the evil eye, the whole pendant with the blue eye, or even Italians deal with the evil eye, which I can tell you a story that's like really freaky about that. So here's some of my analysis. So for my evil eye, I see that's an alliteration, but we capitalize the E therefore personifying it. So it's not the old man that bothers him, but it's the evil eye, okay? It's, a, it's something else, not the man himself. Now, an eye is actually um, also known as the letter I, as in yourself. 
So when he says the evil eye, is he referring to the eye or the eye? Okay. I know you're probably rolling your eyes now at this point, but bear with me. Now, the evil eye is also related to something of a curse. Um, it was believed to be cast by a malevolent glare, usually given to a person when they are unaware. Many cultures believe that receiving the evil eye will cause misfortune or injury, and there's actual talismans. So, like uh, in Greek um, countries, they'll have like that beautiful pendant or talisman that they wear. It's like blue, it's really cute, whatever. Um, in Italians, we have something else, which is usually like the red hot chili pepper. Um, and that's supposed to go against anyone that will give you that evil eye, that evil stare, that curse that we're trying to befall on you. Now, when I was young, uh, my grandmother used to tell me all the time, like, oh, you know, if you have a headache or if you're not feeling well, it could be because of someone's giving you the evil eye. And she had this whole um, prayer set up. And the prayer was like pretty interesting. Um, she would take three utensils, right? And it would be, let's say, the, the fork, the knife, and the spoon. She would take a bowl of water. She would do, like, the sign of the cross. Then she would take olive oil, and she would do the sign of the cross on my forehead. Afterwards, she would take that oil that she touched my forehead with and would drop it into the bowl of water. And that oil droplet would turn into, basically, an eye. And if it got bigger and meant someone was talking mad smack about you, if it just stayed small, it's because you had a headache. I imagine me when I was young, you know, like when you have a grandparent taking three utensils and doing the sign of the cross, like, you know, I was like, are you going to kill me? You're going to like cannibalize me? <laughs> but um, those are just like old wives tales that people would use. But um, in today's tradition, there's still a lot of people that do believe in casting an evil eye and trying to protect yourself from it. So we could see as though that the narrator was thinking that maybe this person was casting an evil eye on him. Then he does refer it once um, to the vulture eye because it had a clear white film over it. Now, most eyes that have a white film over it is because they have either like the cataract or glaucoma or something. But for this guy, he thought it was a vulture eye because they too have these white films over their eyes. Now, the vulture is an animal that circles around dead or dying animals. So the idea of a vulture um, looking at you and circling around you or glaring at you is almost like this foreshadowing element that something negative is going to happen to you. And we saw this very um, often in the Velt with this, the, the vultures doing the same thing to George and Lydia. So the narrator feels like the old man's vulture eye is actually foreshadowing the narrator's demise, which in a sense it kind of does happen. Now we have our next two symbols. We have the beating heart and then we have the planks. Now, the heart is actually very interesting. Now, the heart is, um, you know, there's that saying, like, you need to think with your heart and not with your mind or not with your head. Here, the heart is a very telling nature that we see. Now, the beating heart is expressed very often in this story. The author uses imagery, specifically sound, to express the narrator's obsession now with the heart. So we left the eye, the eye is gone, now we move to the heart. Now, if you notice, a calm person's heartbeat is usually slow, right? The whole boom, boom, boom. However, a nervous person's heartbeat will be obviously like boom, 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 boom. Now, excuse the typo here. It says, whose heart is the narrator actually hearing? Is it the old man or is it his own? So he's trying to vanquish someone else, but in some way, we're not really sure where he's getting at. Whose heart is he actually hearing? Now, in the end, the heart beats so quickly and loudly that the narrator calls the policemen villains. He yells at them, villains. He goes, um, here is the hideous heart that is beating beneath the floorboards. Now, the irony is that you're calling policemen the villains, almost as like you're a bad person for catching me, which is the whole theme of perversity, the idea is that you think that something good is actually bad, but that something bad is completely normal. Murdering the old man because his eye and his heart is normal. The policeman doing their job is evil. Okay, you see that there's this huge contrast. Now the floorboards goes back to the question about the symbolism of hiding something within your home. So the wooden planks represent the actual secret within your own home. The narrator hid the old man's body within the floorboards of his own home, which demonstrates his overconfidence. He was super cocky at the end. He's like, what do I have to fear? He goes, the guy's dead. He's not going to come back to life or anything. But then he, heard, he continuously heard the heartbeat, again, thinking, did I kill the guy properly? Or whose heart am I actually hearing? 
invites the policeman to actually sit and places the chair on top of the same floorboards his victim was resting on, just to show his confidence or this inner trophy that he found. And then you ask yourself, the, nar the narrator wants to get caught. Not really certain. But if you go back to the beginning of the story, he basically says something of where he is and that he's going to tell you the story of what happened and that he is not insane. Now, where do you think he'd be telling his story after everything is said and done? Okay. So based on the analysis, I'm going to have you guys do basically the same thing that I did looking at symbolism as well as analytical questions with the next story next week called The Black Cat by Edgar Allan Poe, which deals with a very similar author, excuse me, narrator, as he deals with a, an obsession over not an eye and not a heart, but with a black cat. And there's a lot of supernatural elements. And um, I'm gonna be honest with you, it's very gory in nature, but it's one of the beautiful things about Edgar Allan Poe that I want you guys to enjoy. So um, after watching this video, I'm gonna ask you to go to the comment section of this class and I want you to answer the right question here, which is in your opinion, who or what is the narrator truly trying to destroy and why? Please make sure it is minimum 100 words and have it done by Sunday night. Thank you guys and uh, have a good week.